talk about finding the balance between staying in the present moment and I don't want to say planning, but investing in the future? Oh, my favorite subject. Because it seems that the moment kind of robs you of any dimensions of the past, present and future, and that is just not true. If you look at the Diamond Sutra, it says, the mind which is divided into past, present and future cannot attain awakening. Reverse the equation and something beautiful occurs. In this awakened moment, there is all the karma of the past, present and future. So that's how you can perceive cause and effect, whether it's cyclical or linear in the three realms, the three realms of past, present and future. And that perception can help you. You can design whatever you want, you can make your plans. But the fundamental truth does not change, that you can only realize these plans now, at this moment. They can build from the past, refer to the present, and compass the future. But only this moment is your chance. You cannot go back to the past, cannot go forward to the future, and you cannot enter an alternate present. So this moment is the key. But this moment has it all. So when you plan, just plan. And then make it happen. If you plan clearly, then what's happening is wonderful. If the plan is not clear, not adaptive, then something too rigid or too loose can happen. You know, there is fundamentally two ways of playing music. One is from the notes, the other is by heart. And some people swear that, oh, by heart is the best. Look at those jazz musicians. They just don't use any notes or barely any, and they play for hours. The others say, oh, no, 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 no. Look at this orchestra, the classics, you know. When the conductor just flips over those A3 sheets all the time during the concert, then Bach or Haydn just unfolds like a miracle. We need to do both. We need to be able to plan, and based on that, adapt and improvise and keep our direction clear. And for that, our view has to be insightful, perceptive, i.e. good enough. When that happens, our plans can be realized in a way that is mutually beneficial for you and your environment. My family is very Christian. I was raised in a very traditional... God bless you. Um, thank you. He has risen indeed. Every time I tell them that I'm living in a Buddhist temple, they either change the subject or start to cry. Um, yeah, crying is good. So should I give up or should I keep trying to nudge them in the direction of... Try to do what exactly? Make them more open to me. Can I make you more open towards Christianity? No. Can you make them more open to Buddhism? No. So put it down. Hmm. Be with them, eat with them, laugh with them, walk with them. Zen doesn't exist. Buddhism is not an ism. So don't talk to them about this because they are not interested. So talk about subjects that actually are kind of connecting you. Sung San Sunim used to say for these questions, if people are open, teach them the Dharma. If they are not open, just give them good words. If that's not possible, give them what they need. And if that is out of the question, just do together action. Remember these four, it will help you a lot. You cannot convince them about the excellence of Zen. No way. But you can join them in ways that they would never expect and they would acknowledge and recognize that. So take Zen out of the equation. It will be very good for you. Where have you been? On a holiday. Hungary is a very nice place. And by the way, those roofs, they are curved like Asian, so something interesting is happening there. Okay? Good. Chanting um, this specific um, tradition, um, why? Why not? Some traditions are very against chanting. Not so much. I have never seen any tradition that would be against chanting. Tell me one. Vipassana? 
Vipassana, as you experience it, is a westernized version of Theravada Buddhism, where they took out all those elements that would be an initial hindrance before the Western practitioner. But if you visit Thai temples, I've seen quite a few in Singapore and Malaysia, Sri Lankan temples also in Malaysia and Singapore. They are all doing chanting three times a day, sometimes more. Vipassana here is a simplified and sometimes really attainable version of a predominantly Thai and Burmese meditation style. It doesn't mean that it didn't exist. They just don't use it here so much. Mm-hmm. Believing that it's easier for the Western student not to mumble words that they don't understand. Well, by now, every practitioner in our style knows that without chanting, we are up the creek without a paddle because it's so powerfully cleansing your karma, especially emotional karma, that without chanting, your meditation would be 10 times harder. Bowing, bowing, that doesn't really exist in Theravada, nowhere. I mean, they bow nine times or three times, but they don't bow like us 108 times, many times a day. It's a specific Mahayana invention from Tibet to Japan, Korea, China, Lots. In Japan these days, not so much. But in the old days, they had that. Bowing is like breaking ice. The ice of your karma, the strongest attachments. Chanting is boiling the water to 108 degrees Celsius. And sitting is like the wind that blows the clouds away, the wisps of your karma. But if you just have warm winds, then the iceberg would not relent, it wouldn't melt. And that's why sitting in the West is sometimes such a bad experience for the beginner because all their karma is hitting them in the face without any sufficient instructions or protection. It can be tough. So bowing, chanting, physical work, they are a very, very necessary uh, precursor and preparation to sitting meditation. And that's why it's so good. That's why everybody loves chanting. And you do that very, very nicely. So please, keep chanting in this enchanting Viking girl voice. Okay? Summoning all the ridges of the Sierras and the Scandinavian mountains with the small Viking villages in the Fjordur. Okay? Thank you.